Welcome to Excellent Grades Academy. This is Dr. Bison E.M. Welcome to Blood Physiology Part 2. If you haven't seen Part 1, the link will be in the comment section. Click on it and watch our first video on blood physiology. Okay, so you can register for class on all the courses in anatomy, physiology, immunology, and microbiology, biochemistry, organic chemistry, and psychology. On this number, plus 2609754977. Nine zero, Okay, so in our last video, we were talking about erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis. Now, erythropoiesis is red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And the stages of red blood cell is that from the stem cell, so this cell, this same, this cell here is the hemopoiesis hematopoietic poetic pluripotent prepotent stem cell this is going to differentiate into what we call a pro erythroblast erythro erythroblast this pro erythroblast will then differentiate into an early erythroblast. The early erythroblast will turn into an intermediate erythroblast. So intermediate erythroblast. This intermediate erythroblast will then turn into a late erythroblast. which will turn into a reticulocyte and then into a mature erythrocyte. So this is red, red blood cell maturation in the bone marrow. So what will start happening is that uh, on the stage of the late erythroblast, the nucleus disappears. So here, on the late erythroblast, you are coming from the intermediate erythroblast to the late erythroblast. The nucleus disappears. Okay. So for this maturation to take place, we said there was going to be folic acid and vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is absorbed from the ileum of the small intestines by the use of intrinsic factor, which is produced by the parietal cells of the bone marrow. Now, if the red blood cells are produced, they have a half-life. So red blood cells have a half-life of of four months or 120 days. After 120 days, the red blood cells will will be destroyed. Okay, they will be destroyed. After 120 days, by the reticulo endothelial system, we call it the reticulo endothelial system system which is in the spleen and the liver in the spleen and the liver okay so so the uh, the red blood cell is destroyed because it becomes old and it's rigid it's no longer flexible so when the red blood cell is destroyed it is broken down in its in its two components okay the red blood cell is destroyed and it produces hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made up of two things, which we're going to list down here. One, the globin chains. And two, we've got heme. Okay. Now, heme is made up of two things as well. So, heme is made up of iron, which is uh, iron 2. Okay, iron 2, and it is made up of porphyrin. 
Now, what is the fate of these components of hemoglobin? So let's just write them down again. So hemoglobin is broken down into number one, globin chains. So globin chains, these are simply proteins. The proteins will be broken down to amino acids. These amino acids will be reused. That's what happens to the globins. Okay. What about the iron? The iron too. The iron is going to form complexes with uh, apoferritin. So when the when the iron combines with the apoferritin, then it will form what we call transferrin. This transferrin is going to take the iron to sites in the bone marrow where hemoglobin can be formed and then it will be reused. Okay. The porphyrin part of the heme is broken down to bilirubin. Bilirubin. Now bilirubin is excreted. So excreted. It's excreted in the urine which makes gives urine its characteristic yellow color and in the in the feces so this is what happens so iron plus porphyrin this two is what gives you him so hemoglobin is made up of him plus globin the him is made up of iron and porphyrin so everyone needs to know how the hemoglobin is separated after it is broken down after it is broken down okay now anemia let's talk about anemia anemia is a condition where there is reduction in the red blood cells reduction in the red blood cells okay they are different types of anemia different types of anemia these include number one they're called nutritional anemias so nutritional anemias is where you have anemia due to a lack of intake of certain things like folic acid you're going to have megaloblastic anemia so if you've de you have decreased folic acid intake you have megaloblastic anemia you have decreased vitamin b12 in your diet you're going to have pernicious anemia if you have decreased iron in your diet you're going to have what we call hypochromic anemia hypochromic anemia okay hypochromic anemia is also microcytic anemia okay. your red blood cells are going to be very small so if you have reduced iron intake you're going to have microcytic anemia so this is one type of anemia nutritional anemias number two second type of anemias are called hemolytic anemias now hemolytic anemias are due to excess so this is due to due to excess destruction of red blood cells excess destruct destruction of red blood cells this can be caused by Number one, drugs. There's, there's some drugs that will cause hemolytic anemia. Okay. Number two can be caused by diseases. Diseases like, like malaria. Like malaria, where you have thalassemias. So thalassemias, you have abnormal hemoglobin. And those who have sickle cell anemia. So those with sickle cell anemia have got a sickled rigid red blood cell that cannot pass through the reticular endothelial system so there's going to be a lot of destruction so this is the second type of anemia the third type of anemia is called aplastic anemia so aplastic anemia is as a result of a reduced function of the bone marrow of bone marrow so what you're going to have the bone marrow is not producing enough red blood cells the cause of this type of anemia is excess use of drugs. Okay. 
the excess use of drugs so they can be caused by drugs can be caused by exposure to radiation excess exposure to radiation and the malignancy of the bone marrow so malignancy of the bone marrow bone marrow so these are the things that can cause the three types of anemia okay let's move on let's look at blood indices blood indices are simply a variation in the size and number of cells or a reduction in hemoglobin count so blood indices will show us the size of hemoglobin uh, the amount of hemoglobin in the red blood cells it will also show us the size of the red blood cells okay so now let's look at the common blood indices that we have number one packed cell volume which is also known as hemoglobin it's used to express the ratio of blood cells to plasma okay the ratio of blood cells to plasma so the normal value for the packed cell volume is 45 percent okay we know that 45 percent of the blood is the cells so packed cell volume is an indice that shows us the ratio of the cells to plasma which is 45 percent but in females it is slightly lower due to their reduced red blood cell count packed cell volume is increased in polycythemia remember polycythemia we said there's an increase in hematocrity so increase in hematocrity which means that there are more red blood cells than they're supposed to be most of the times it is greater than 65 percent if the hematocrity is greater than 65 percent then you have polycythemia packed cell red volume is also found in severe dehydration in dehydration there is a reduction in plasma volume okay why because there is reduced water and you know that water is 92 to 95 percent okay 93 actually 93 to 95 percent of plasma so if you are dehydrated there is reduction of water in your plasma so the ratio of your blood cells to your plasma is going to decrease so in severe dehydration the packed cell volume also increases the packed cell volume decreases in anemia why because in anemia there is a reduction in the number of red blood cells that's why the packed cell volume goes down okay now the hematocrity in males is 40 47 so here is males here is in females in females is about 42 and the red blood cell number in males is about 5.4 million and in females it's 4.8 million the hemoglobin concentration in males is 16 grams per deciliter and in females it's 14 grams per deciliter so of course these are ranges okay they are ranges they've just picked one number from the range the next index that we're going to look at is the color index so it expresses the ratio between hemoglobin and the red blood cell percentage considering that the red blood cell count of 5 million is a hundred percent so the normal values values is 0 0.85 to 1.14 so now if the color index is reduced it's not in this range then you have iron deficiency anemia okay so iron deficiency anemia is also hypochromic hypochromic anemia why that means hypochromic simply means low chromic means hemoglobin so low hemoglobin anemia if you have a deficiency in iron you're going to have low hemoglobin why because hemoglobin is made up of iron and protein chains remember what we said hemoglobin is made up of globin this side which are just protein chains plus iron plus porphyrin okay porphyrin these two form him so if you have low iron in your body you're going to have low hemoglobin hence your color index is going to be low so that is called hypochromic anemia what is going to happen again is that your red blood cells are going to be small so it, it can also be termed as microcytic anemia okay microcytic anemia as well so low iron will lead to hypochromic anemia and microcytic anemia Number three is the mean corpuscular volume, the MC 
V. So it indicates the average volume of the red blood cells. The normal value is 90 cubic microns. So now, if your red blood cell is small, we say they are microcytic. If your red blood cell is big, we say they are ma macrocytic. So if you have if you have a high than normal MCV, then you're going to have microcytic red blood cells. They're going to be big microcytic cells. If you have a low MCV, you're going to have microcytic cells. They're going to be small microcytic cells. Okay. So macrocytic cells is seen in pernicious anemia. In pernicious anemia where you have a lack of vitamin B12 or a lack of folic acid. Microcytic cells are seen in iron deficiency where you don't have a lot of iron. So all these terms, you're supposed to be relating them. Number four is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin. So this gives an idea about the average hemoglobin content in a single red blood cell. And the normal values are between 28 and 31. Okay, 28 and 31. So if you have a low MCH, then we say you have hypochromic because the hemoglobin is low. If you have a normal MCH, we say you are normochromic. Normochromic. If you have a high than normal MCH, then you are hyperchromic. Okay, hypochromic. This is seen in iron deficiency anemia. Okay, and then this is seen in polycythemia vera. So polycythemia vera, seen in polycythemia vera, where there is abnormal production of red blood cells. Then the fifth one is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So it indicates the relative percentage of hemoglobin in the erythrocytes and, and its normal value. This is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Okay. So those were the blood indices. Everyone is supposed to know the blood indices and how to interpret them. Now let's look at leukocytes, which are just white blood cells. Okay, so they are larger than erythrocytes. They contain a nucleus. Remember, erythrocytes do not contain a nucleus, but these contain a nucleus, and they do not contain hemoglobin. So the normal leukocyte count varies between 4,000 to 11,000 cells of the blood, and in the majority, the range is restricted between 6,000 to 9,000. Okay, so now a study of the shape, the size, and the appearance of the white blood cells reveals that leukocytes are of five different types. Leukocytes can be classified into granulocytes and granulocytes. You know that granulocytes are three in number and these are two. So you add them, there are five types of leukocytes. Okay, there are five types of leukocytes. The, so the granulocytes. The first one that we're going to look at is the neutrophil. The neutrophils are the most abundant. They are the most abundant leukocytes. They are about 60 to 70 of the total number of nucleocytes. They have a multi-lobed nucleus. That the, the, so the nucleus has about 3 to 5 lobes. This is how you identify them on a histological slide. And the cytoplasm contains fine granules. That's why they are called granulocytes. Granulocytes have got granules in their cytoplasm. Granules in their cytoplasm. Okay. Granules in their cytoplasm. So these neutrophils have got fine granules in the cytoplasm, which take a neutral stain. That's why they are called neutrophils. In case you wondered why we call them neutrophils, it's because they are granules take a neutral stain. So from neutral, we say neutrophil, neutrophils. Okay. So neutrophils exhibit phagocytosis, meaning that they engulf the bacteria and kill it. And their count increases in acute infections. They form the first line of defense in the body. Okay. So now physiologically, an increase in neutrophil count is observed during menstruation. When females are menstruating, the neutrophil count increases because there are high chances of infection. 
also in pregnancy and in muscular exercise. So if you want to increase your neutrophil, neutrophil count, exercise a lot, and then they're going to increase. So in acute conditions such as pneumonia, appendicitis, tonsillitis, the abscess, the neutrophil count increases. So neutrophil granules contain enzymes which include myeloperoxidase and proteases, which help in the destruction of microorganisms. That is very important. The processes of phagocytosis induces the mechanisms such as chemotaxis, opsonization, ingestion, and degranulation. Okay, so those are neutrophils. So this is a neutrophil. This is a histological uh, slide. You've seen them one in one of my my YouTube videos. So it has this lobe here. Okay. It has another lobe here and it has another lobe here. So you've seen that the nucleus has got about three lobes and the stains here are neutral. So this is a neutrophil. So this here is a neutrophil. Okay. But when you look at this, this is not a neutrophil. Why? Because the stains here are red or purple. They are red here. So this is an eosinophil. An eosinophil is another type of granulocyte. What you see here, these are simply red blood cells. Because you can see they have no nucleus. Okay. So this is a neutrophil. Let's look at eosinophils. They are actually bilobed, so they have a bilobed nucleus and shows presence of relatively large granules which take an acidophilic stain. So the granules in the cytoplasm of an eosinophil appears red. Okay? And they range from about 2 to 5% of the total leukocyte counts. They are observed in allergic reactions. Okay, so remember this this is very important so they are observed in allergic reactions and the increase in eosinophils is what we call eosinophilia okay. so these increase to inhibit the intracellular synthesis of histamine they are released in attacking parasites such as roundworms and threadworms by increasing by releasing their granules so in children if the children have got worms the white blood cells that are largely involved in attacking those parasites are eosinophils. They are eosinophils. Let's look at basophils. Basophils have got a bilobed nucleus as well, and they've got blue granules. Okay, they these are basophilic. They are basophilic. Basophils releases histamine, and they occur specially in hypersensitivity reactions such as anaphylactic shock. Okay, so the basophil count increases in in polycythemia and in chronic myelo myeloid leukemia. So note that basophils function in um, allergic reactions, hypersensitivity reactions such as anaphylactic shock. That's where basophils are. Uh, uh, employed the account is from zero to one percent okay so those are the granulocytes that we have basophils which are basophilic eosinophils which are acidophilic and are used in attacking parasites and neutrophils all right so these are basophils this is a basophil here see the nucleus is filled with blue granules okay what you see here this is an rbc so also the nucleus cannot be seen here because it's also uh, blue, but it's it's bilobed. So the bilobed nucleus of a basophil. All right. Now let's look at our granulocytes. These do not contain granules in their cytoplasms. So they do not contain granules in their cytoplasms. That's why they are known as a granulocytes. A gran R means no, no granules. They are lymphocytes. So lymphocytes have got a large oval rounded nucleus. Okay? So they are subdivided into large and small lymphocytes depending on their size. Their size. Okay, so they they are about twenty to 
30% of the leukocyte count in the body. And these show a significant increase in chronic infections like tuberculosis. Remember, in acute infections, the ones that were working were the neutrophils. But in chronic infections, the ones that are working are the lymphocytes. Okay, so lymphocytes are here. This is a lymphocyte, and it's got an oval nucleus as big as the cytoplasm. It's almost filling the entire cytoplasm. So this one here is the nucleus. It's oval, it's large. So when you see a cell like this, even in your histological slide, just know that this is a lymphocyte. There are two types of lymphocytes. So there are T lymphocytes and there are B lymphocytes. Okay? So lymphocytes are responsible for providing immunity to the body. There are two functionally distinct nucleocytes, which are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes, these produce antibodies. So they produce antibodies. We already talked about antibodies, which are known as immunoglobulins in our first video. Go and watch that and look at the types of immunoglobulins that are produced. So they are involved in immune and defense mechanisms and are described in the video that we were talking about. Okay, so those are lymphocytes. Now let's talk about monocytes. These are the largest white blood cells and have a kidney-shaped nucleus. Okay kidney shaped nucleus so consequently one side of the cell shows large amount of non granular cytoplasm so they are about 3 to 8% of the total leukocyte count monocytes are also phagocytic in nature in function meaning that they will engulf the bacteria and they will kill it okay so monocytes count increases in kalaaza in malaria in infectious mononucleosis and monocytes leave the circulation to enter tissues and differentiate into macrophages. So they change the names. So macrophages or monocytes are called differently according to the different locations in the body. In the skin, they are called Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells. So if I'm not mistaken. All right. In the liver, they are called histiocytes. Histiocytes. In the lungs, they are called dust cells. So according to the site where they are, mac uh, macrophages have got or assume very different names. Okay. They've got very different names. Because so this is the macrophage. It's very big. Okay. And see the nucleus is here. So it's on one side of the cytoplasm more than the other side. So you can see this side of the cytoplasm has got no space, but this side of the cytoplasm, there is space there. So it's more like the nucleus of the uh, monocyte is lies on one side of the cytoplasm than the other. Okay. All right. Now let's look at the aneth count, which is the number of lobes. The edge of the neutrophil can be determined by the number of lobes present in its nucleus. The number of lobes increases as the cells grow and mature. So the grouping of nucleophile, neutrophils, based upon the number of lobes, is what we call the aneth count. So in the healthy on individual, the aneth count is this. N1, meaning that the neutrophil that just has a nucleus that has one lobe is about 5 to 10%. N2, the neutrophil has got two lobes, 25 to 30%. N3, the neutrophil has got three lobes, is about 45 to 50%. N4, where the neutrophils has got four lobes, the nucleus has got four lobes, is 15 to 20%. N5 is the least common, where here the neutrophils has got five lobes. Okay, Five lobes. The nucleus of the neutrophil has got five lobes. So all of these neutrophils are present in the individual in these respective percentages. This is what we call the aneth count. Okay, That's the aneth count. So an increase in one and two lobed cells, so we're talking about neutrophils here, is what we term the shift to the left, and it indicates granulopoiesis, meaning the formation of granulocytes, which are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. But on the other hand, an increase in the four to five lobed neutrophils 
constitutes a shift to the right and indicates a low leukopoiesis and poor body response to infection. So if you see an increase in the neutrophils that have got four to five lobes, it means that there is uh, a poor leukocytosis and there is a poor response to the infection that is going on in the body. What are the functions of leukocytes? Phagocytosis, where they engulf bacteria and foreign material in attempt to eliminate the infection. Number two, anti-allergic uh, effect. So the histi histamine release during allergic conditions is inhibited by eosinophils. So the eosinophils will prevent the histamine, which could cause inflammation and could uh, subsidize or prevent an allergy. Antibody formation. So the lymphocytes, especially the B lymphocytes, are the ones that form the antibodies. Number three is heparin production by the basophils, which prevents intravascular clotting. So in the blood vessels, there is no clotting cause of heparin that is produced by basophils. Terephone production, leukocytes help in the formation of treforms from plasma proteins, which are needed for growth and repair of tissues. Leukocytosis, so leukocytosis is a term that is used to indicate an increase in white cell count and is a common feature in most infections. So if there's an infection, leukocytosis is going to take place, meaning that the bone marrow is going to make a lot of white blood cells to combat that infection. So a physiological increase in leukocytes is seen in menstruation, in pregnancy, and in muscular exercise. I always tell people to exercise more so that their immunity is, uh, goes up. So a reduction in what cell count is what we call leukopenia. And it is seen in bone marrow suppression which can be caused by drugs and x-ray radiation. It is also seen in pernicious anemia and infections such as typhoid and malaria. Okay. Thrombocytes are what we call platelets. These platelets are formed from megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. So megakaryocytes produce platelets in the bone marrow. So platelets... We know that megakaryocytes are produced by the effect of thrombopoietin on the stem cell. Okay. So these are very small. They're biconcave, non-nucleated, meaning they have no nucleus. Platelets have no nucleus. The average size of platelets is 2.5 microns. They are very small. And their count ranges from 300,000 micro, microliter of blood. So they increase. The increase in platelets is seen in hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is bleeding in splenomegaly and in Hodgkin's disease. The lifespan of platelets is about 10 days. After 10 days, they die off. A reduction in platelet count is called thrombocytopenia, which is seen in splenomegaly, meaning that your spleen is big. A plastic anemia, your bone marrow is defective, so it's not producing blood cells. Acute infections, leukemia, which is cancer of the blood, and idiopathic thrombocytopenic papula. Okay. The functions of platelets, they arrest bleeding. Okay. So because they aggregate at the site of the injured blessed vessel, and they form a plug. In coagulation, platelets release clotting factors, which we're going to see very soon. Clot retraction, the release of thrombobestinin from platelets helps in clot retraction and then they repair the endothelium which is the epithelium of the the blood vessel they also release serotonin and epinephrine which produce vasoconstriction to prevent bleeding okay to prevent blood loss or to reduce blood loss papula which is the reduction in platelet count a reduction in platelet counts results in papula okay it is a bleeding disorder in which hemorrhage tendency increases and may be subcutaneous hemorrhage okay now let's look at the coagulation pathways in our bodies this is important and there's a, always an essay that comes so there are three pathways that make up the classical coagulation pathways we've got the intrinsic pathway okay and then we have the common pathway here 
and we've got the extrinsic pathway. So all of this you're supposed to know. So surface contact here, where you injure a blood vessel, and uh, platelets activated growth factor is uh, released from a blood vessel. It will convert factor 12 to activated factor 12. Okay, So factor 12 is what we call the Hedgeman factor. And then activated factor 12 is going to activate factor 11 to activated factor 11 which is plasma thromboplastin. This plasma thromboplastin will activate factor 9 from inactivated factor 9 to activated factor 9, which will then activate factor 10. Okay, so from inactivated factor 10 to activated factor 10 using calcium, okay, using calcium and factor 5. Then the activated factor 10 is going to activate prothrombin. Now remember, prothrombin is a beta globulin. Okay, so it is produced from the liver. So this prothrombin that is activated, it's going to uh, be activated into thrombin. The thrombin will now convert fibrinogen, which is uh, a plasma protein again to fibrin. This fibrin is the one that will form a clot. All right. So, where the blue ends here, this is the common pathway. Okay. And then this is the extrinsic pathway. Where you have tissue factor, we, when there's tissue damage, tissue factor is going to convert factor 7 to activated factor 7. Activated factor 7 is going to convert factor 10 to activated factor 10. Activated factor 10 will then convert prothrombin into thrombin thrombin will then activate fibrinogen into fibrin all right into fibrin and then fibrin together with activated factor 13 which is the fibrin stabilizing factor is going to form a stable clot the clot is going to block the damaged part of the blood vessel and bleeding is going to stop so this is how the coagulation pathway occurs so platelets are produced in the bone marrow from megakaryocytes, which we have already talked about, okay, by the action of thrombopoietin, which is a hormone that stimulates the hematopoietic multi pluripotent stem cell to produce megakaryocytes. Okay, lastly, but not the least, let's talk about blood grouping. So blood groups are genetically determined by the presence of antigens found on the surface of the blood cells. Okay. So agglutination is a process whereby cells clump together and occurs when blood cells with a specific antigen encounter its corresponding antibody. So when you have an antigen reacting with, an, with its antibody, that's when agglutination occurs agglutination so by all means necessary you want to prevent this reaction because it might bring a lot of problems okay so agglutination uh, uh, results in hemolysis which is just destruction of your red blood cells okay destruction of red blood cells okay so now the abo blood group system consists of four main groups so let's talk about the groups the blood grouping now according to the ABO groups and these are determined by the presence or absence of antigens A and B. Let's look at the groups. Okay. So these are the groups. Group A can either be AA or AO. So this is homozygous. This is heterozygous. The antigens that are on group A is A antigen. And this A antigen, this blood this blood group has got anti B antibodies. So meaning if it is this blood is exposed to blood group B, the antigens on blood group B will react with these antibodies and they will cause agglutination. Okay. Blood group B can either be BB homozygous or BO heterozygous. The antigens on blood group B are B antigens and they have antibody A. 
And then we've got blood group AB. It has both A and B antigens on the surface of the red blood cells and it has no antibodies. Blood group O is recessive. Okay, it's recessive for homozygous. So O is a recessive allele. While A and B are dominant alleles. That's why when you pair A, A and O, it tends to be blood group A. If you tend if you pair B and O, it tends to be blood group B. Because O is a recessive allele, allele and B and A are dominant alleles. So blood group O has got no antigens at all, but it has antibodies, anti A antibodies and anti B antibodies. Blood group O is a universal donor. Why? Because it has no antigens. It has no antigens. It has no antigens. Blood group AB is a universal recipient. So a re universal recipient. Recipient. Why? Because it has no antibodies. It has no antibodies. So those with AB, those with AB blood groups, they are universal recipients. Those with blood group O are universal donors. They can donate to all other blood groups, but can only receive blood from blood group O itself. Okay. Now the most frequently found blood group is blood group O. So most people in the society have got blood group O followed by blood group A. So frequency of blood group O is 47%. Frequency of blood group A is 42%. Blood group B and blood group AB are very rare to find. Okay. Very rare to find. All right. So here, this shows an image of a skull, a fetal skull. And what you see here, so this is the demarcation of the skull. What you see here is an hyperactive bone marrow. Okay. Hyperactive bone marrow because of too much production of uh, cells. All right. So let's look at the, the recess blood group system. So the Nessus blood group system compr comprises of five main uh, antigens, namely C, recessive C, D is the most common one. So the term Nessus positive usually refers to those individuals who express the D antigen on their red blood cells. Okay. Those who express the D antigen on their red blood cells. So most people are Nessus positive. Because they've got the antigen D on their red blood cells. So the production of immune antibodies. But there are some people who are RH negative. Okay. Who are RH negative. Now, what happens is that the people who are RH negative, if they get pregnant and the child in their womb, is less le is lesser positive. What will happen is that there will be antibodies that are going to be produced against the red blood cells of the recess positive child. Okay. So what will happen is that they will be pregnant the first time, and if they are their blood and the blood of the child get mixed up, there will be production of immune antibodies. So those immune antibodies most commonly known as the anti-D occurs after sensitization by pregnancy or by transfusion. Where, let me explain this. So a person is pregnant and they are recess negative. And then during delivery, the blood for the recess negative mother mixes with the recess positive child's blood. So what will happen is that because of exposure to the recess positive blood, there will be antibodies that will be formed against the recess positive antigen on the red blood cells. So the next time the woman gets pregnant, what will happen is that the antibodies against the recess positive red blood cells 
will move from the woman's blood and will go into the blood of the the fetus and what will happen is that those antibodies are going to make the red blood cells in the fetus in the womb to agglutinate and we said agglutination results in hemolysis so there will be hemolysis in the baby that is growing in that woman's womb that disease is called the hemolytic disease of the newborn or erythroblastosis fetalis erythroblastosis fetalis okay so let me just look for it erythroblastosis fetalis okay so the destruction of fetal rbcs can give rise to the appearance of erythroblasts in the blood leading to erythroblastosis erythroblastosis fetalis so this is a very common question that comes an rh so rh negative mother will get pregnant the first time okay first time and then because of exposure to rh positive blood the mother is going to build anti d antibodies so after that child is born, after she gets pregnant the second time, these anti-D antibodies are going to move into the blood vessels of the second child and they will cause the, the red blood cells in the second child to hemolyze or to be destroyed. And that condition is what we call the erythroblastosis fetalis or the hemolytic disease. Hemolytic disease of the newborn of the newborn that's what happens all right that's what happens okay so this has been blood groups rh compatibility and uh, erythroblastosis fetalis so when you are transfusing someone always make sure that their blood groups match the abo system is matching and they RH status is matching. If they are positive, they're supposed to receive positive RH positive blood. If they're negative, they're supposed to receive RH negative blood. Okay. The hazards of incompatible transfusion, there's going to be agglutination. Agglutination will cause hemolysis and there will be fever and chill. There will be jaundice because there will be a lot of red blood cells that are being destroyed. And you know that red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which contain Porphyrin. Porphyrin will be converted to bilirubin. The bilirubin is the one that is responsible for jaundice. There will be renal failure and there will be uremia and ultimately death. So people who have been given the wrong blood in the hospitals, if nothing is done about it, they end up dying because of too much destruction of red blood cells. Okay, so this has been long, but I hope it has been educative. All right, see you in the next video when we'll be doing muscle physiology.